you to join in as well. Okay? So, do it for yourself first, and then if you feel like doing it for the person sitting next to you, <coughs> you can. Okay? So, the first thing the shaman usually does, having done all the dancing, and he leads the singing, the bamboo stompers are playing away, and so on, and he will ask people who are unwell to come into the centre. Okay? So these are people that he feels, or they themselves feel, or their families feel, are seriously unwell. And he does a dance, usually with a whisk, round. Okay. Now, in the middle, you, you might just be able to see on the middle, is a centrepiece of special leaves. Okay. And we never ever quite worked out how the shaman did it. I mean, there must be something. But he would put his hand up and squeeze the leaves and show everybody water in the leaves. And then he would spray that over everybody, because that was supposed to be sort of very healing, and from the head soles of the plants that were on this centerpiece. And he always got water. Um, you know, I had the kids, and I said, don't go to trance, watch. And we all go, <laughs> we never worked out quite what they did, but he always got water. Because everybody was in <coughs> But what you're going to do is just see how it sounds. Would you put your, ha your, your fist on your arm and, <coughs> and suck? slowly 
he turns into a tiger himself. It's very, very interesting. And they put, turn down all the lights, stamp down the fire. Um, the women are beating out a very subdued rhythm on the, with the bamboo stompers. And he always has an assistant who's waiting, who puts a little bunch of flowers by the entrance to the hut. And then you hear a scratching on the bamboo of the house, and they all jump. They all almost go through the ceiling, because that means he's now Tiger. And rather than actually do any, any touching for the healing, people who are ill just lie down near the shelter, because this Tiger energy is supposed to be so powerful that that's what will happen, he will be healed. And when he emerges from his trance state and is a, a person again instead of tiger, you'll always point to the flowers, which are now wilting. Again, how that's done, we had no idea. But every, both those times we witnessed it, the flowers had wilted after the actual tiger seance. Now, what I found very interesting is that the Temyars would insist even if they denied other things, they all know we don't believe in that, we're more, we're more progressive, we're more, you know, we're more modern. But they still believed in the power of the tiger shaman to turn into a tiger. And one of the older men reported that he'd gone to a nearby town and was sharing um, a room in a guest house. And without realising it, the shaman with him turned into a tiger. And he said it was actually terrifying, I had to do something about it, I had to hold him, I had, and so on. And that just totally convinced him that these things happen. So, what I think is important, whatever we might believe about otherworldliness, so to speak, the fact that one can enter into a trance or semi-hypnotic state, which is where one can get in touch with healing energy. And that happens in whatever tradition we believe in of healing. I'd like to just give one little example of uh, witnessing the power of the healing. Uh, in terms, and this man was a tiger shaman, although this didn't happen at a tiger seance. We were staying in another village upriver from where we, where our actual house was, and my youngest son, who was seven at the time developed a very high fever. And you know when children go all glazed, when their fever is very, very high. And I was in the middle of nowhere. I was obviously very worried. So I had arranged that we would come back down river to our house, and then I would get him into hospital. And the shaman said to me, well, while you're waiting for the boat, would you like me to try some medicine? And I said, well, I thought if you did some healing, then we would have to stay. And he said, don't worry. I've asked, or well, I will ask, one of my friends to look after Hal um, on, the, you know, on the journey back to the village, you see. And I'd assumed he was giving a message to other shamans, okay. So he did the, what you've just all done, um, he massaged Hal's tummy, he found a stone that he showed him. Which, um, Hal's temperature even came down a, a tad then, because he was actually very interested in the stone that he said had been in his tummy. And we got into the boat, uh, myself, the three children, and our boatman, and he was poling us down the river, the log boat, and an enormous bird came out of the forest and hovered over the boat. It was huge, the wingspan like this. And my boatman said, you see, he said he'd asked one of his friends to look after Hal. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, no, 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 go, go on. Put the, not quite pull the other one, but that's a coincidence. He said, all right, wait and see. And that bird followed us all the way back to our village. It would fly off in the forest another mile. It would come out, circle the boat, go again. Okay. And when we got back, that house temperature had dropped. But I just thought I would still get him checked out because he'd been so very ill. So I took him to the hospital. And the doctor said, goodness me, this boy's been ill. He said, what did you take? He said, I couldn't say a bird. 
<laughs> even in Malaysia, right? I said, well, there was some natural medicine that, uh, because we were far away. Anyway, he said, no antibiotics. I said, no, no, no. He said, well, he's got very severe lesions. He said, they're, they're, they're getting better. You don't need to do anything now. But he's had a major, a major throat infection. And that's a very living example of this, shall we say, a combination of other world, but also earth. This experience was very earthed with this bird. Um, and there were other, other things that we witnessed um, while we were there. Just to finish off, um, what is very sad at the moment is the exploitation of the Temianas. I would ask you to go onto a website and sign a petition when you see what's going on. It's on actionwork.com. And if you look for uh, Temiars, you'll find a whole lot about the Temiars. <coughs> the rainforest is being cut down and being replaced with oil palm. And you can't live in a, in a palm grove, can you? So their natural habitat is being robbed from them. For the first time in their lives, they're beginning to demonstrate and protest that they're being arrested and put in prison. And various property developers are building huge, expensive housing conglomerates. And this last year, there have been two major landslides, one which is completely destroyed, um, a Temiar village. And for the very first time, Temiars are ending up in a psychiatric hospital with depression. Which is it's when they have their own healing system that works. I find this incredibly very, very sad. So a, a bit of consciousness raising at the same time. That if you if you know people or if you want to say something on the on the website, please do, because somehow we've got to stop this uh, decimation of their habitats and their houses. Having said that, if you want to know more about the Temiars, talk to me at the interval. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, so much. So much. I remember when I was in training and I was a very, very privileged to have had Sue, Sue was present when I was training as a drama therapist and she told us and brought the most amazing stories and films about this kind of tribal healings that when, when me, I saw many of you go, oh my god, it's amazing and of course it all makes so much sense.